because you're turning yourself into clowns. Right. So, right, so from the Oxford Britannica, right, so the Persians overrun large parts of Anatolia, the Turkic Avars who ruled over the Slavic and other tribes that occupied the region between the Don and the Alps exacted tributes. In 614 the Persians conquered Syria, Palestine, taking Jerusalem and what was to believe Christ's cross in 619, okay, uh, and occupied uh, Libya. Right? An effort to placate the placards, Heraclius met them at Thracian Heraclea. They sought to capture him. He rode back to Constantinople. He was pursued all the way. Right? So this is a man who's fighting for his empire. Right? Now, I don't know if you know by then, but they were also deeply religious. In 622, clad as a penitent and bearing the sacred image of the Virgin, he left Constantinople as prayers rose. Constantinople, as prayers rose from its many sanctuaries for victory over the Persians, the Zoroastrians, and the recovery of the Holy Cross, and the reconquest of Jerusalem. So those were his goals. Capture Jerusalem, reclaim the Holy Cross, and he went out as a penitent carrying an icon. Now the point that I'm making, because I don't want to talk too much, I just want to, I'm going to land on this point now so you can reply is that when we look into the history of who Heraclius was, he was a man of deep piety and commitment to the Christian faith. Now, do you think that a man of deep piety and commitment to the Christian faith is going to abandon the religion because of the conversation that is recorded in Sahih Abukari 1.7? Do you know what happened in that conversation? So, from, from what I recall of the conversation, he asked some questions, Abu Sufyan some questions about the description of yep. the Prophet Muhammad. Yes. He asked him questions and um, he responded however he responded, Abu Sufyan did. It's possible, it's possible, you, you'll see people that they have a few questions. Like when it comes to Al Islam, how are you doing, Akbar? Salaam alaikum. You alright? You alright? When it comes to the religion of Islam, yeah. someone may say to someone here in Speaker's Corner, or ask the question, Who, what do you believe about Jesus Christ? As a Muslim, what's your belief in Jesus? We believe that he's a prophet of God and a messenger, like Moses and Abraham and, and those who preceded them. Um, and what is your belief concerning this, this, this and that, right? Can, can we just go through what the question in no, what I'm the question in Hadith I'm addressing it. It's about, it's, it's relevant to Heraclius. So, because you asked me, is it possible that such a man, as you read, he was penitent, he was carrying the cross. Who led the first Christian religious yes. crusade. Right. Is it possible that this man would leave Christianity Based on, this conversation. based on this conversation with Abu Sufyan, I would say yes, it's possible. Right, let, let's actually look at the question. Bearing in mind, right, what I've read from you from the British Oxford Encyclopedia is that we see a man who leads a religious war to retrieve a piece of wood. He wears penitential clothes, even though he is an emperor. Yeah. And he goes out and he fights for the Christian faith against the pagans of the Persian Empire. Right? And these are the questions that he asks according to this hadith. And you're trying to suggest that this is enough to convince him. And I don't think it is. It's possible. No, it's I don't. Possible, I, because that, right. that's, that's, let's be fair. Why, if I say yes, it's possible he did. You say no, it's not. It's our opinion. Right, but, but the point is, we are both people of experience. And we both know people of deep commitment and faith. Yes. Now, while it is possible for a person of deep commitment and faith to change their religion, and they do yeah. all the time, I was just speaking to a Muslim this week who's become a Christian in Egypt, right? They, they, they do change their faith all the time. It's not uncommon. But people of deep faith and commitment don't do it on their very first encounter it's, it's with a new religion. It's, it's possible. It's possible. I don't it's like, possible. And, and if, you, if you look into the, like the, the history of people who've accepted Islam, you may find many. You might find uh, like people who were uh, nuns, monks, devoted in, in monasteries and vice versa. They have one conversation concerning uh, Islam. Yeah. And you might say that they, they, they embrace Islam at the end of that conversation. Right. Let, let's actually look at the questions that, that, that are put into the mind. Let, let's look at the, the questions that Heraclius asks, okay? Right? He asks these questions, right? Uh, let's go back. Right. There we go. So the first question he asks is, what is his family status amongst you? 
the second question he asks has anybody amongst you ever claimed the same before him to which the answer is no that's just the answer no uh, the next question was anybody amongst his ancestors a king the answer is no Heraclius asks, do the nobles or the poor follow him? The answer is, it is the poor who follow him. Then he asks, are his followers increasing or decreasing? The reply is, they are increasing. Then he asks, does anybody amongst those who embrace his religion become displeased and renounce the religion afterwards, which is the point that we uh, discussed earlier? And the answer is, no. Then he asks, have you ever accused him of telling lies before his claim? The answer is, no. Does he break his promises? The answer is no. We are at truce with him, but we do not know what he will do in it. I could not find the opportunity to say anything against him except that. Heraclius asked, Is he here? Wait, wait, wait. Have you ever had a war with him? The answer is yes. Then he said, What was the outcome of the battles? The answer is, I replied, Sometimes he was victorious and sometimes we. And then Heraclius asked, What does he order you to do? And then he says, He tells us to work worship Allah and Allah alone and not to worship anything along with him and to renounce all our ancestors had said he orders us to pray to speak truth to be chaste and to keep good relations with our kith and kin right now according to this hadith that conversation and those replies are enough to convince a man who had just won a religious war and thanked God for the victory of fighting pagans and fighting this religious war and winning and building churches in celebration of it, but wearing penitential clothes even though he's an emperor, carrying the icons of the Virgin Mary, using his money and treasure to retrieve a piece of wood because he thought it was sacred. Yeah. And this hadith is meant to convince us that this conversation was enough to convince him to right. abandon his religion. Habib. It makes no right. sense right. at all. Okay, can I respond to that? Yeah, go on. Right. So, um, when, it, when it comes to uh, the converse, like, as I said, it's subjective between us. Yeah. If you, you, you can say it, it's impossible. I can say it's possible, like there may be one question a person has concerning Islam, yeah, and it's enough for them to become Muslim. Now, also in, on, on top of the, on top of that, this conversation Abu Sufyan had with Heraclius, it's possible that when Abu uh, Heraclius went away, he had a conversation with somebody else, or there was there was more information that he tried to extract from Abu Sufyan, yeah, which. In, a, in addition to the questions he had, which was not narrated, yep. and that um, added to his conviction, and okay. he became Muslim. Yeah, carry on. You know? Yep. Um, so, even if, for example, he said, um, has this man, like the question that he asked, has this man had any, uh, along the lines of, uh, anyone in his, his, his ancestry that were kings? And he said no. If that convinced him, that convinced him. Yeah. It's, it, it's every, everybody, it's, it's a subjective thing. Like, people accept this. It takes some people years and years and years and years to accept Islam. Like myself, like it took me a long time. I took, what, maybe six years. God, and then you get somebody else who has one conversation, you accept Islam straight away in speaker's corner or wherever you may be in the world. It's everybody's experience varies. Right. I just want to. I just want to find you the bit. Um, <laughs> but can we not agree on that though? That everyone's experience is different. And, but I think there is. I think there is also uh, a degree of reasonableness that we have to apply to this. In that they. It, in that this argument it relies on 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 many angles the, the one of the keys to this angle right because let us and gain for the sake of the argument to demonstrate the point that I'm making and gain give you allow you your point I'm, I'm not gonna wrestle with that point so I'm gonna accept that maybe in his heart he wanted to convert to Islam right but the thing is he announces to the entire people that we're all going to do this and I want to find it um, here we go right 
So uh, it's, it's all right if I read that much of the passage. Yeah? Go for it, go for yeah? it. Yeah? Okay. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's your literature, so... No, it's even, if it's, even if it's your literature, right. and we're getting somewhere, then right. why not? Okay, after hearing that, Heraclius remarked that the sovereignty of the Arabs had appeared. Heraclius then wrote a letter to his friend in Rome, who was, a go who was as good as Heraclius in knowledge. Heraclius then left for Homs, a town in Syria, and stayed there till he received the reply of his letter from his friend, who agreed with him in his opinion about the emergence of the prophet and the fact that he was a prophet. On that, Heraclius invited, so we've got correspondence now. So th this, this text is saying that Heraclius wrote a letter and that someone wrote back. Now my question to you is, how did Abu Sufyan know that? What, what, what information? Did so you... after Abu Sufyan clears off, yeah. right, Heraclius, right, he stays behind, okay, and he sends a private correspondence to his, to, to someone in Rome, who sends a private correspondence back, right. okay, how does Abu Sufyan know that these two wrote to one another? How does he know about that? It's yeah. possible it was, it was conveyed to him. Like, what? It's possible that that was conveyed to him. By who? Whoever it may be. Right. So, my point to you is, if Abu Sufyan hears about this letter, why is no one else in the 7th century hearing about this? Hearing about the correspondence between Heraclius, Heraclius and, and, and Rome. Rome yeah. what, what, what do you mean nobody else is hearing about it? Like, well, my, here's my point. Because given what this text is saying, we should reasonably expect corresponding evidence. Because this text is claiming that Abu Sufyan knew about a private correspondence between Heraclius and his friend. And if Abu Sufyan learns about it, then we can expect that other people knew about it as well. Not exactly. And yet we know of no one that talks not, about not it. Not precisely. Not exactly. I mean, for, exa like, for example now, if there's a correspondence between um, me and you. Yeah. Right? It, it's, it's one person could come to know about it here in Speaker's Corner and the rest could, the rest could not. It doesn't necessarily mean because one person has learned of that information that many people must... Do you think that, what, do you think that, do you think that the Emperor of Rome and Abu Sufyan became best friends? No, but it's possible that Abu Sufyan knew somebody who was close to the emperor, close to someone, or the person who was corresponding. It's probably, are you, are you there's know, many, there are many ways the information know, can reach you know, them. The, the, I think that's a cope, honestly, what, what, a cope. Cope. Cope, when you clutch at straws to try and make it at straws. No, no, not at all, because it's, it's it, you, you, you know and I know that it's, like, he has got access to the emperor. He's, who asked? Abu Sufyan? Like, he's talking to the emperror. As so you does can the see priests, from, yeah, no, and but the bishops, what, but and the legates. But what I'm saying is... And his, count, and his how, courtier advisors. How many people in, in, in his... Um, under uh, Abu Sufyan's in Ab Ab Abu Sufyan's kingdom, not Abu Sufyan, sorry, Heraclius's kingdom. Yeah, like the um, the Romans. Yeah, how many of them do you think had access to Abu Suf uh, Sorry, Heraclius. Right, that's a great the question. The regular people. And, and quite a lot, actually. When you're the emperor of one of the biggest empires, you don't get left on your own. You've got courtiers all the time. No, but I'm talking about the general folk. The general folk. I, I, there, there's going to be there's going to be, be people in the Byzantine Empire who know uh, and have access to Oraculus every single day. But not everybody. Definitely not Abu Sufyan. No, but I'm, my point is... You're trying, think about yeah, what you're trying to yeah. get me to believe. Yeah. You're trying to get me to believe that some Arab messenger that Heraclius met once knows more about what's happening in Heraclius's private life than his own courtiers and historians. Yeah, no, so, look, Do you see why I'm when, struggling? Like, firstly, Abu Sufyan have an access to him. Say, say now there's, there's like the, um, the advent of Islam is kicking up a stir. It's kicking up like, a lot, lot of people are hearing about what's going on in Arabia, yeah. about what's happening amongst yeah. the people of Mecca, um, that there's been a battle between the Muslims and the pagans, and the Muslims beat them when there was only 313 of them and over a thousand yeah. pagans. Yeah. Now, if Abu Sufyan come, he, he, they learn that there's a caravan that's arrived in the kingdom of Heraclius. It's possible then that due to his, he's hearing about this, he's heard there's an Arab caravan, Due to him wanting to inquire more, it's possible for that reason. I, I mean, I, with regards to the details of how he, he got access, 
to the court of the king, yep. to the court of uh, the emperor Heraclius. Yep. I don't know those finer details, whether it's because they heard of the caravan, they invited him in, or for whatever reason. Yeah. But there are ways. It, it, it's not an impossibility. And I, also, I with think, regards to like the, the, the correspondence. Okay. So and, I, and Bob, can I just say? Yeah. Let me, just to conclude, I'm not. It's, I'm not trying to. I'm, I'm being reasonable. I'm not trying to clutch at straws. It's possible. Like for example, now, like a correspondence between uh, Prince. Uh, uh, King Charles for example King Charles and um, somebody else a private conversation it's possible that people like us even though we're not close to him we can still somehow get that information due to knowing somebody that works in right. the palace for yeah, example so, so there's the thing is one of the ways that we do history is that we don't add extra theories that are unnecessary to me well, wait 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 this is, this is historical methodology is that if the evidence that you're presenting requires ad hoc, uh, ad hoc extra links in the chain for it to hold up to scrutiny, it means that the evidence you're presenting shouldn't be trusted. Yeah, but the thing is, and that's what you're doing yeah, right now. But you're sure. adding extra sure. links to the chain because I've I've asked you a question that demonstrates the falsity of the text can, itself. Can I just push back on what you just said? Yeah. Now, going by that um, criteria. Going by, um, you, you're saying you, you, you know, you can't. Um, basically, you're theor theorizing. You need, you need evidence. Basically, is what you're saying. I need, I need evidence for what I'm claiming. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, now that we can say the same for earlier on with the Abu Sufyan and his his daughter incident. We don't. You do not have evidence that that information reached Abu Sufyan that his son-in-law had apostatized. Which is so, which is why, if you remember, in earlier in the conversation, I said. That's a possibility, but I argued why it's also more reasonable to suggest that he would have asked why his daughter had yeah, not but, returned but, from Abyssinia. But, but again, that, that means you're going against your own criteria because you, you're you're saying uh, that he was is more reasonable. You're saying man should ask about his daughter's disappearance. No, no, or hear not. this, hear this. You're saying that you were trying to say that he was a liar, but you don't have the evidence for it. Is what well, I'm saying. I, I do have the evidence. No, no, that he that the news reached him concerning his uh, son-in-law apostatizing. And that, and that, if you remember, I said what we need to do is we need to check the time differential between the visit to Abyssinia and his supposed conversation with Heraclius, because the bigger that gap is, the more likely he would have asked the question. But what I'm saying is that you haven't verified that, and you're making that claim, and you're saying, we, I can't make a claim, but you haven't got the evidence. Right, right, but so, so let, let, that's one of the questions everyone should go away and look at. What is the time differential between the event in Abyssinia Fine, and yeah, this conversation, we'll because that if it is in months or years it's reasonable to conclude that he would have asked where is my daughter why hasn't she come back with everyone else but what I'm saying is okay fair enough I get what you're saying I'm not saying it's unreasonable what you're saying but what the point I'm making is you're coming to me now telling me that I can't give these theories if I don't have evidence I'm saying let me finish please you're not I'm finish. I'm just really want, I just want to say hi please for you yeah I've seen see you guys on video cool. so many times. Cool man, what's your name? My name is Javed. Javed. Phone nice in from Oman. Oman. Yeah. Nice to meet and you. And I've man. seen your videos, I've seen your arguments, your arguments, Hashem, and it's cool watching you guys. Are you are you visiting? Are you I am visiting. So I I just took out some time to come here specifically to meet you guys. Are you a Christian bro? No. Muslim? I'm, I'm Muslim but I believe in God and I think we Can I give you a God. gift to welcome you into my country? Okay. Since you've greeted us so friendly, I'd like to give okay. you a gift. All right. Just to show. But I'm also Muslim, don't worry. A bit of, a bit <laughs> of human funny. solidarity for you. Yeah. Do you have a Bible, bro? Uh, if you're going to give me a Bible, I, I read everything online, so I do have an e-Bible. E then oh, I won't give oh, you a Bible. I'll oh. give you a book you can't get on e-Bible. Uh, uh. Okay. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm being rude. I interrupted you guys. There you go. Okay. Merry All Christmas. right. Thank you. Take care. Take, Take care of yourself. You. Enjoy your stay. Thank you very much. Right, so, so but the point, just because I was talking before yeah, you, you were, so the, the point I'm making is, you're, you're telling me that I'm basically theorizing, I'm saying you were doing the same thing earlier. What, what I'm saying is that you are, you're trying to explain away uh, something that a, a reasonable man would look at this and go, right, this causes us to doubt the evidence. Explain. Let me finish. Yeah, sure. Causes us to doubt the evidence because the narrator of this hadith is claiming to know about the private correspondence of the emperor. Remember, this emperor spent his entire life, his entire yeah. life, sorry. Yeah. 
seems like it was moved. Yeah. You know, this emperor spent his entire life fighting the Muslim world, right? In history, that's that's a fact. Now, the the other problem with it, so so I've, I've I've suggested to you that's a good grounds to doubt this hadith, and then your response. Sorry, the reason sorry, what's the grounds is to the, the the narrator of this hadith right. is claiming to know about the private correspondence of the Roman Empire of the Roman Emperor where not only not only is he saying he knows who he wrote to but he's saying that he knows what was said it's possible. It's possible. I, I, I think a reasonable man would conclude I think a that without person, corroborating evidence, it's more likely that this is a lie. No, I think a reasonable person can say that it's it's possible for such information to reach people. How many how many private conversations of like um, in the palace, for example, here, and private conversations amongst like uh, politicians and, inf and and sensitive information gets leaked to the public here? Yeah. So th that's my point about corroborating evidence. If if your argument is true, then and bear in mind what comes next in this story, and I'll just read it because it, it adds to my point, but it's linked to the previous point. So in this hadith, it goes on to say that that on that Heraclius invited all the heads of the Byzantines to assemble in his palace at home. He goes on to say that Heraclius invited, listen to this next bit, all the heads of the Byzantines to assemble in this palace at Homs. When they assembled, he ordered that all the doors of his palace be closed. Then he came out and said, O oh Byzantines, if success is your desire and if you seek right guidance and want your empire to remain, then give a pledge of allegiance to this prophet, i.e. embrace Islam. So here he's invited all of the elites of Rome to embrace Islam, right? Look at their reaction according to this story. On hearing the views of Heraclius, the people ran towards the gates of the palace like onagers, but found the doors closed. Heraclius realized their hatred towards Islam, and when he lost the hope of them embracing Islam, he ordered that they should be brought back in audience. So in other words, the Hadith is saying that this is a traumatic event. And this is all the leaders of the Byzantine Empire, that's bishops and its legates, right? Councils, consuls, those kinds of people. Are you telling me that the entire literate class that have this traumatic event, none of them bother to record it in history, none of them put it down? in a letter. This is why a reasonable person, if this story was true, would expect would expect corroborating evidence. Okay, I, and we I, have I, none, I, zero, just, nada. Just, just to push back on that, when it comes to like, um, if, because you said if such a traumatic event occurred, yeah. why was it not recorded by the people that were, the, contemporary, the, the people who were there and experienced yeah, like it? Like the Gospels. Right. It's possible, it's possible. How long ago was this? This is over 1400 years ago. It's, it's possible, like people here, people in, in this day and age, people diary, they, they journal, sorry, yeah. they journal, yeah. right? Um, they, they may go home and they may express it to their, their, their family. Yeah. Something happened at work today. Yeah. This, this event happened, my boss did such and such, it was yeah. such a nasty thing yeah. that he did, whatever. Yeah. Um, they just tell their family about it. Yeah. Uh, it's possible that they write it down and they send a letter. Yeah. So, all, all of, just because we don't actually have it, does not mean that they did not they did not record it down. People have different methods. Of yeah, you know, you're, you're arguing that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, yeah, basically. And I agree, uh, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But my point to you is this: is that in the absence of corroborating evidence, in the fact that the evidence, the only evidence that you have is 200 years later from the event that it describes. Sahih al-Bukhari is 200 years yeah, later. Yeah. That's another discussion. Are you talking about the hadith because the hadith... Yeah, the, the, let, me, let me continue. The fact that the, the character, the, the story itself raises some really peculiar questions about knowledge that's beyond Abu Suyatkaf, Sunan, Suf Sufyan. Sufyan's uh, control to know which, which the knowledge private about correspondence is, between the Emperor of Rome it's, it's, and the it's, it's not beyond this. Is, the, is, fact uh, that, the fact that the, the, there's a question mark about whether Abu Sufyan is a liar in the story, the fact but, that... But then he could be truthful. The fact that, the fact that the 
entire elites of the Roman world, according to the story, go through a dramatic experience and we find no corroborating evidence to it at all, none from the 7th century. The fact that what we do know about Heraclius is that he was a deeply religious man who fought a religious war to retrieve a religious icon and recapture the holy city of Jerusalem, all, right. all point to us as knowing or uh, uh, of having certainty, a high degree of certainty, that this hadith is a fabrication. Right. Okay, just to push back. Now, when it comes to, again, like... Um, Abu Sufyan and his integrity. As we've said, we have not, we've not proven either way, myself or yourself, that Abu Sufyan received the knowledge, the information, the news of his daughter, um, his son-in-law, sorry, apostatizing. Um, when it comes to the corroborating evidence, there could be one witness, like for example, this gentleman here witnesses our conversation. Only him witnesses our conversation. And then years and years later, a thousand years later, it said that Bob and Kyron, they had a discussion about such and such a thing. And then for somebody to turn around and say, well, but no, there was no other people that said it. To be clear, it's the entire elites of the Roman Empire. Okay, sorry, that okay, invited to sorry, this sorry, sorry, my, okay. Let's just say there's a group of people here, a group of people. The most all, literate, all, of, the most all of Speaker's Corner, all of speaker, Speaker's Corner, we're here listening to our conversation. Just because the accounts of the of, of majority of the people don't survive history, it does not mean that because only one of them survived, that because the others didn't, that his one is is not reliable. We can't let depend me, let on Let me ask it. you this question. What do, do you... Do, do, no, but do you see that point I just made? Do you I get see the point? point that you're making, but your, your argument, I think, is unreasonable. Why is it unreasonable? It's unreasonable because this is the, the elites of the Rome... I've, I've stated why I think it's unreasonable. The evidence is late. The evidence is singular. The evidence itself contains discrepancies that immediately alert someone uh, to its biases. It's in the no, a, thing, a, a yeah. point I didn't mention before. Yeah. It's in the context of a war against the Byzantines, right. in which Muslims occupied Christian land, the Byzantine land, and Byzantine populations were around. So this suits this suits uh, the the the, the, okay. the context of being propaganda to discourage those native populations. Sorry, native populations. It suits the idea of it being propaganda to discourage. What, what biases? Those what biases do you? Find? within there do you feel um, makes it out to be uh, propaganda to try and uh, so within the story yeah. the problems within the story it's trying to convince me that a deeply religious man asked a couple of questions and suddenly decided that he wanted to become Muslim but we already addressed that bearing in mind how the Byzantine court worked the Byzantine Emperor would have known that if he had suggested because I don't know if you know anything about the Byzantine Emperor remember when I read from uh, Encyclopedia Media Britannica. Heraclius actually deposed Emperor Focus. Do you remember I read that? The reality is that Roman emperors were always finding excuses to topple one another. The main reason for toppling someone was military failure, right? But in this time, bearing in mind that it is on the back of the, the fact that Christians have fought these schismatic battles against heretics from Arius to Nestorius and so on, the idea that the emperor would have endangered his own position by saying to the entire elites of the Roman Empire, let's change our religion. It doesn't right. smack true of history okay, because an emperor right. Right. would have placed his own position in danger by doing that and he would have been toppled as an it's, emperor. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, okay, perhaps perhaps he would be um, um, toppled if he if he was to say such a thing or propose such a thing to his, um, you know, his council or whatever, whoever it was was around yeah. him but when you see like for, the, for example the like the companions of the Prophet Muhammad before they were Muslim yeah right they, they had certain positions you have Mus'ab bin, bin Umayr he was a prominent he, he was a, a very wealthy individual at the time and when he accepted Islam he lost that he lost his, his, his mother withdrew her support um, you know the Muslims they lost a lot and 
when it comes to the faith of an individual, yeah. you even see this in this day and age, how many Muslim people become Muslim and they get kicked out of their houses? A Sikh, Sikh, I know somebody who's a Sikh, became Muslim, was kicked out of his house. It's like the Christians that get abused in... Uh, I know a sister who became a Christian up, up north, in north of England. She, she is, you know, her parents have turned around and said to her, because you've left Islam, you have to leave the home. Yeah, look, and she's been a beautiful daughter so, to so, her so, But look, my argument is not, oh, <laughs> um, about people, like, I'm not, I'm not basically trying to say Christians are bad because they kick Muslims out. People, when they become Muslim, they leave Christianity and they become Muslim, they kick them yeah. out of the house. I mean, that's not the point I'm making. What I'm saying is that when people accept a faith, like when they accept Islam, yeah. you'll, you'll see these uh, individuals being told to leave the house, yep. being stripped of position, whatever it is that happens, but they they, they, they stick firm to their religion still. Yeah. They, 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 they're, because of their faith, they, they, they are willing to endure. Right, now I'm going to prove to you that they're willing to your source. Let me, let me I finish. get your point. Let me finish. Okay, they're willing to endure. Show you they're willing to endure. Any, you know, anything that their, their family wants to throw at them. They're willing right. to endure it. So what I'm saying is, when it comes to Heraclius, because you're saying about him being toppled, they would these, um, basically because he's an emperor, it would be beyond him doing such a thing because he would lose his position. It's not impossible. Yeah. When faith settles in the heart of somebody, yeah. they may be willing to lose their life, okay. their family. Okay, right. And, so and I heard your argument. Now, 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 Heraclius and Abu Sufyan. Heraclius. So, so, so now, he didn't accept this. Now, now, now let me show you, now let me show you why that argument doesn't work even according to this text because as the brother just beat me to the punch are we still recording yeah drop your gloves right listen to what the all story says about Heraclius to show that he's not the kind of person you've just described to defend the point against the point I made because I made the point if Heraclius really did this he would have endangered his own position and you said well some people care more about truth than their own position right do you not agree with that right no, I do agree with that. 